Okay. Welcome, everyone. I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon. I'm Maria Safiotti Dale, and as president of the Friends of the University of Wisconsin Madison Libraries, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's lecture by Jason Steinhauer History Disrupted How Social Media and the World Wide Web Have Changed the Past. Since 1948, the Friends organization has been championing our great library system here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. We are a vo volunteer organization that strives to bring visibility to campus libraries and to the world-class collections they hold. The Friends provides grants to scholars who come from around the world to do research in the exceptional collections of the campus libraries. We also provide uh, uh, grants to uh, the libraries themselves for strategic priorities. And the Friends Outreach Mission also includes a wide variety of free public events and lectures, such as the one we are honored to host tonight. Our activities are made possible by donations in two principal forms, monetary gifts and used books. So uh, we are happy to accept both. And when you donate books that you no longer need, uh, we include them in our semi-annual book sales. The 52nd annual spring book sale starts tomorrow with the preview sale from 4 to 8 p.m. in room 116 of Memorial Library and continues through Saturday, April 1st at 1 p.m. Please plan to stop by uh, Memorial Library to check out the amazing selection of books, vinyl, CDs, maps, and who knows what else <laughs> you'll find there. We'd love to see you there. Tonight's History Disrupted event would not have been possible without the collaboration of a constellation of campus sponsors. The George L. Mossy Program in History, the UW-Madison Public History Project, the University Archives, the Wisconsin Historical Society, the Center for the Humanities, the Department of Communication Arts, and the German, Nordic, and Slavic Department in the College of Letters and Science. I would like to thank each and every one of them for their con contributions of time, funds, and all the efforts of our wonderful colleagues who helped us make this event a success. Many of these sponsors were sought out by Troy Reeves, head of the oral history pro program at the University Archives. It was Troy's initiative to bring Jason Steinhauer to campus. So please join me in welcoming our oral historian to the podium to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm Troy Reeves, oral historian at the University Archives and Records Management. It's my pleasure to introduce Jason Steinhauer. Uh, before I do, I need to say a couple of things. Uh, first, um, Libby, uh, Libby Tooney, Thuney from The Friends wanted me to remind you that this is being recorded, if you couldn't tell by all of the accoutrement. So this will be particularly important if you're going to ask a question at Q&A. Um, that question will be recorded, so keep that in mind. Uh, First, I want to thank uh, Maria for mentioning the event sponsors. Uh, I want to personally thank Libby and the Friends of the UW Madison Libraries, without whom this event would this event wouldn't have happened without them. Um, a quick additional note about the Friends: I was actually going for more sponsors when Libby told me to stop, which is kind of great and weird at the same time. I mean, great because you know the Friends is here, but kind of weird because as a humanist, I'm constantly have my hand out asking for money, so it felt weird to be able to stop doing that. Um, last housekeeping item, the Center for the Humanities, one of the sponsors, is hosting Jason tomorrow at noon inside 126 Memorial Library for a student-focused public works workshop. So any student in the audience, please consider attending. Uh, no lunch is served, but there will be snacks and select drinks. Jason and I have been colleagues and friends since 2011 when we met at the Oral History Association annual meeting in Denver, Colorado, and it's been an honor and privilege to stay connected with him since. Jason's talk here is well over a year in the making, starting in late 2021 when Jason's book moved from vision to reality. Truth be told, however, I think Jason wanted to be here in the fall, uh, particularly during a Badger football weekend. 
to relive the one he attended in October 2014, when he also participated as we hosted the 2014 Oral History Association annual meeting. It should be noted he attended that game instead of the conference sessions that day. <laughs> Which is local arrangement chair for that meeting, I think I've finally forgiven him. Maybe. Uh, as Jason Steinhauer says in his bio, he's passionate about creating an educated, informed, and historically and media literate citizenry. He served as the founding director of the LePage Center for History in, in the Public Interest, is currently a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He has contributed to Time and CNN as a past editorial board member of the Washington Post made by history section, and is a current presidential counsel counselor to the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. In 2014, he coined the term history communicators and has worked with colleagues worldwide to found the new field of history communication. He is the founder and CEO of the History Communications Institute. His best-selling book and topic of today's talk, History Disrupted, examines how history gets communicated on the World Wide Web. In 2020, he founded the History Club on Clubhouse, which he hosts regularly. The club has more than 100,000 members and averages 2,500 participants per week. Jason has traveled overseas with our Department of State as a part of diplomatic exchanges between the US and the European Union. He has spoken at events around the country and in Europe and appears frequently in the media. As a native New Yorker, he is a long-suffering New York Jets fan. <laughs> Since this is being recorded, I will abstain from Aaron, any Aaron Rodgers comments. Uh, really, I'm abstaining because there are just too many things to say and we're not here to talk pro football. So please join me in welcoming Jason Steinhauer. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, well, thank you guys so much for having me. I am super psyched to be here. As Troy mentioned, the last time I was here was in 2014 for the Oral History Association Conference slash Wisconsin football game. Um, and uh, I love coming to places like this. I was in uh, East Lansing uh, last night at Michigan State. I love, I went to NYU, New York University, and George Washington University, which if you're familiar with either of those two places, they don't have much of a campus, right? It's like you're smack in the middle of the city. You don't see a lot of, of trees. You see a lot of like, high rises and not a lot of local stores and, and unique boutiques. So when I come to a place like this and I see this beautiful campus, all this community and vibrancy, it really excites me, it kind of makes me feel a little whimsical for the college experience I maybe didn't have. Um, so um, it's a lot of fun to be here and I'm stoked that so many people came out. It's great to see you all. Um, I need to get some slides up because there's a lot that I want to talk about and not a lot of time to do so. Um, but before I do that, because this is a lecture about social media, I'm going to take a selfie and you all are going to be in it. So if you'll do me a favor and just indulge me for a second. Um, everybody look up and say hi. hi. Well, how about a little wave? Perfect. All right. So um, Troy gave you a little bit of background about me, but I want to tell you a little bit more about me because it's going to give you a little insight into why I wrote this book and what we're going to talk about today. So uh, I put a couple of things up here uh, about me, just give you a kind of where I'm coming from on all this. So um, I actually began my career working in the field of public history in museums. Now, uh, there's probably some people here who are not familiar with the term public history. Do people know what that refers to? A couple people. Okay, so let me briefly explain that. So you're, people are aware that there's this thing called professional history. There are people who work as professional historians. And oftentimes we think about professional historians, you think about college professors in academic settings that are teaching or doing research or writing academic monographs. But there's this whole world of historians who work in museums and in libraries and in archives and in government institutions. Places like the State Department, for example, has a whole office of historians, right? And sometime around the 1970s, 1980s, those historians who worked in that area of the profession began to think that, you know, while we're all historians, there's uh, certain things about our work that is a little bit different from being a professor inside of a university, right? We interact with public audiences every day. We may not be writing a monograph or a book, but we may be doing an exhibit or putting a curriculum together or giving tours for teachers, right? So all historians, but a slightly different take on being a historian. And that group of uh, scholars got together and called themselves public historians that created the field of public history. 
So that's the world that I came up in. I began my career in museums. I worked at a Holocaust museum in Lower Manhattan called the Museum of Jewish Heritage. The first uh, exhibition I did was about American Jews in the Second World War, and it was followed by an exhibition about Jewish refugees in New York after World War II. So Jews from Iraq, Jews from Iran, Jews from the former Soviet Union. From there, I kind of branched out on my own. I was an independent curator and archivist for a few years. I worked for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Actually, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, people may not know this, has an office in New York City. So we would actually go around and collect material uh, from the New York music scene to be put in the Rock Hall. One of the things we did was we got the, um, the poster boards from the Hit Factory. Hit Factory was a recording studio. So we got these poster boards that said, like, you know, Whitney Houston at 3 o'clock, Bruce Springsteen at 5 o'clock, Michael Jackson at 7 o'clock, whatever. So we got to collect those and put those in the Rock Hall, which is kind of cool. Um, I actually went to the Dominican Republic and helped to establish a Jewish museum on the north coast of the Dominican. Some of you might know that there were Jewish refugees who came from Europe to the Dominican Republic on the eve of World War II. They established a small community there, and there was actually a museum down there with records of that community. I was the first person to look at those records for over 50 years. Uh, and then after that, I eventually found my way to the Library of Congress in Washington. Everybody ever been to the Library of Congress? Good, good number of you. So the Library of Congress is amazing, 175 million items and counting. It collects 10,000 new items every day in 470 different languages. Whatever subject you're interested in, the Library of Congress has something for you. Uh, I was at the library for about seven and a half years. I began collecting the war stories of America's veterans, and then I moved over to something called the John W. Kluge Center, which brings scholars from around the world to the library to collect, uh, uh, to do research, and then tell people about that research. Uh, I became the founding director of the LePage Center, as Troy said, and I'm now a global fellow at the Wilson Center, and I've written this book. Okay, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because I've spent my entire life and career thinking about how public audiences learn about the past, how public audiences interact with history, whether it be in a museum gallery, whether it be in an archive, whether it be inside the Library of Congress, with think tanks, with policymakers, or increasingly on social media. And so that is the story that we're going to be talking about today. So this, anybody know what this is? This is the inside of the Library of Congress. This is the Great Hall of the Jefferson Building inside the Library of Congress. It's the most beautiful building in all of the United States, but I am slightly biased. And I had the great privilege to actually work inside this building for four and a half years. So my office was just down the hall from here. So I got to walk into this building every day. And this setting, as you can imagine, is a great place to think big thoughts, right? And so one of the people who was thinking very big thoughts at the library while I was there was this guy. And this guy's name is David Grinspoon. And David Grinspoon is an astrobiologist. Who knows what astrobiology is? A couple people. OK, so astrobiology is the scientific study for the conditions of life beyond Earth. So basically, by analyzing the atmospheres of planets and of moons, we can make suppositions about whether there are the conditions for life there, whether it be the clouds of Venus or a moon outside of Ju Jupiter or Saturn, right? And so David is one of these people. He's a planetary scientist. He's an astrobiologist. And he's also something that he and his colleagues call a science communicator working in the field of science communication. And he thinks about how scientific information needs to be conveyed and communicated through various media in order to affect public policy and public understanding. So how do you need to talk about science, whether it be in traditional media or social media, in order for scientific knowledge to have an impact? That's what science communication is writ large. So the more I got to know David and the more I learned about science communication, the more I said to myself, self, why doesn't history do this? Why don't we have something called history communication? Why aren't we training people to be history communicators? Why are we not analyzing how historical information gets conveyed through various media, whether it be traditional media or social media, and how best to do that in order to affect public policy and public understandings of history? Now, obviously, we have historians who are communicating all the time, whether it be in a classroom or public history. We communicate in museums and libraries and archives all the time. But at the time, this is around 2015, 2016, we really didn't have a discipline that was analyzing the communication in any sort of methodological or systematic way. 
to understand its efficacy and to think and learn how to do it better, especially with all the new media platforms that were coming out. And we certainly weren't training people to do that. So I actually suggested to my colleagues that we develop something called history communication, that we train people to be history communicators. I suggested this at the 2015 National Council for Public History annual meeting. And it got a lot of reaction. Some people thought it was a great idea. Some people thought it was a terrible idea. But it at least sparked a conversation. But the other thing that was happening during this time around 2015 and 2016 was, as we all know, social media was becoming this bigger and bigger part of all of our lives. And so it began to become very obvious to me, particularly at the Library of Congress, that the people we were interacting with, whether they were members of Congress or people off the street, increasingly were forming their ideas about the past or what they thought they knew about history was being shaped by the content they were seeing online. And it seemed to me and others that a very pressing history communication question was, what is the effect of all of this stuff? All of this history content on the web and on social media, what is it? Who's making it? And how does it affect how people think about the past? Now, one of the uh, videos online that was informing a lot of people's understandings of history was this video. Is anybody familiar with this video? A couple people. So this, this video came out in 2015. And this video about the US Civil War received somewhere between 30 to 40 million views on social media. Now, to put that in perspective, the average academic book sells about 250 copies in its lifetime. 96% of all books never sell more than 1,000 copies. Now, more people read a book than books are sold, right? You can get it at the library, you borrow from a friend, get a copy off the street, whatever. But the point is, if you were to write a book about the Civil War, chances are not a lot of people would read it. And if you even think about a book like Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, which is one of the best-selling history books of our generation, that book has sold about 3 million copies in its lifetime. This video has 40 million views. So these types of content were clearly having an impact on how people understood the past, and it was shaping what people knew about the past. Now, I'm going to talk about this video a little later, so keep this video in your mind. I'm going to come back to this. But it wasn't just videos like this on YouTube. On social media, there were all kinds of little history memes and history graphics and history this and history that popping up all over the place. On Reddit, on Instagram, on Twitter, all kinds of different platforms, right? And my question was, first of all, who's making all this stuff? Second of all, how and far and wide is this stuff actually circulating? And third of all, what impact is this stuff having, if any, on people's understandings of history, particularly in light of the fact that most people are not reading the history books and articles that professional historians are putting out. Now, as I mentioned, this was also happening in a period where social media was exploding, right? I mean, social media has been around in various forms for now over two decades, but certainly during the 2010s, during the 2015, 2016 US presidential election, around the Brexit referendum, the, you know, social media was really exploding into public consciousness in all of our lives. And we all know that there's a lot of content on social media, but I feel like sometimes it's helpful just to see it represented. So this graph is from 2018. It's already five years old. But you'll see on this graph, for example, that on Twitter, every minute of every day in 2018, users were sending 473,000 tweets. Okay, So that's every minute. Multiply 473,000 by 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks in a year, and you start to realize just how massive a universe this is of content online. And that's just Twitter. And here, YouTube users are watching 4.3 million videos every minute. Right? You start multiplying that out. Huge volume of content. How much of this is history content? How much of this is content about the past? We didn't really have an answer. I will say, as a little footnote to this, researchers in Germany actually working with me and others over this past year put out a report about TikTok, which is not on this graph, but will be on a graph that I show a little bit later. And it turns out that in the fall of 2022, there were 58 billion posts on TikTok with the hashtag history. 58 billion. 
On Instagram, it was somewhere between 46 and 50 million. So this is a huge universe of content, a huge category of content about the past circulating online at any given time amid this broader universe. So as Troy mentioned, I realized that there was a book here. People were writing books about social media and its effects on politics, its effects on science, its effects on uh, journalism, but no one wrote a book about the effects of social media and the web on history. And I kept thinking someone else was going to write it, but no one wrote it. So I figured I had to be the person to write it. So I started the first draft in 2019, the second draft in 2020, the third draft in 2021, and finally the book came out at the end of 2021 and early 2022. Uh, it's been out for about a year now, what, 14, 15 months? This is, I think, the 105th or 106th event I've done about the book. And what's crazy about that is what I pitched this project to literary agents and publishers, they all told me that no one would read it. They said, it's too niche of a topic. No one cares. You should write a book about Trump. That's what people will read. And I definitely did not want to write a book about Trump. There's plenty of those books out there, although Trump does make an appearance in this book in several places. I wanted to write a book about this phenomenon. And so I'm very pleased to share this slide with you, that the book was actually a number one bestseller on Amazon in six different categories. It has been read all over the world. It was featured in Argentina. It's been uh, being translated in Japan. There are members of the Lithuanian parliament who are reading my book. I briefed European parliament and the European External Action Service on the book last year. I presented to the US Department of State, and I was the keynote speaker at the National Security Agency. Which, let me tell you, when you walk into the NSA and you see your picture everywhere, you either wanted or you're giving a talk. Um, so I've been on NPR four times. I've been on C-SPAN. I've talked about this book in a lot of different venues. So the point is that the literary agents were wrong. If you ever pitch a book, just remember, the literary agents are wrong. And the reason they are wrong is twofold. One, people care about social media and its effect that it's having on all of our lives. And this book fills a gap in our knowledge on social media. But two, it turns out people actually really care about history. When you think about all of the wars and battles we've had in the United States, whether it be around Christopher Columbus or Confederate monuments or CRT or book bans, what's the commonality? It all invokes history. People care about history. They care about the past. So this book touches on the past and on social media, which I think is one of the reasons why people like it. Now, of course, in the time that I've written this book, social media has continued to explode. Uh, it's also evolved, though. So as I mentioned, on this graph now, you have TikTok. And just in case you were wondering how many uh, videos are watched on TikTok every minute of every day, the answer is 167 million. So you multiply that by 60 minutes in an hour, blah, 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 blah. It's a lot of content being consumed on TikTok, right? But what's interesting about this, I think, is that social media is evolving in interesting ways, right? Number one, oh, please silence your cell phones. Number one, social media, obviously there are new platforms now that are popping up, whether it be uh, TikTok or Clubhouse or whatever. Two, as we all know, social media is also moving towards more video-based content, right, with Twitch and uh, TikTok and Instagram Reels and things like that. Uh, but what also is kind of interesting to me about social media is that social media, I feel like, is also becoming a little bit more live content based, right? So before, in the 2010s, social media was a lot about like posting and disseminating. But now it's a lot about like live broadcasting, going live on various platforms. Even Twitter is leaning into going live, right, with sporting events and Oscars coverage and things like that. So how that is going to affect you know, how we understand the past, I think, is kind of TBD, but it's an interesting phenomenon to watch. But I will say this. One of the things I realized when I was working on this book is that it turns out that the way people communicate about history on social media is actually pre pretty consistent across platforms. It's almost as if social media teaches you how to behave. And once you learn what works on social media, you then see those tropes and conventions show up on other platforms at other times. So stuff that was appearing on Facebook in the 2010s is actually now appearing on TikTok in the 2020s. It's just been slightly revised to fit the medium better. So actually understanding the history of the history on social media gives you insight into the present and future of social media, because you know what forms and conventions are going to show up. Uh, while I was writing the book also, too, the Frameworks Institute in DC came out with this report, which verified what I already knew, which was that pop culture and social media and the news media were playing an increasingly larger role in how the public was thinking about the past. OK, so that's a lot of preamble. Let's talk about the good stuff. Let's talk about what's in the book. 
Now, I mentioned to you earlier this field of history communication and history communicators. So I like to coin phrases. I like to come up with new terms. So history communicators and history communication was one phrase. And in this book, I coined another phrase, which is on the very first page of the book. And that phrase is e-history. So moving forward, I'm going to use the phrase and term e-history for all this stuff that we've been talking about. And I'm going to explain to you why I feel like that term is valid and what the definition is by using an example, and that example is e-commerce. So we have commerce and we have e-commerce. When I walk into a store and I give someone money and they give me back a good or a service, that's commerce. If I go to Amazon and I buy something from Amazon and they ship it to me and I get it at my door, that's e-commerce. So what's the difference? E-commerce is commerce, but not all commerce is e-commerce, right? What's the distinction? Well, I'm going to argue for you, to you today and in the book that the distinction is twofold. The first distinction is where the transaction takes place. Pretty simple, right? E-commerce happens in an electronic environment, a digital environment. The second is, I'm going to argue, that to make e-commerce possible, there have to be certain mechanics or mechanisms in place. In other words, there has to be a way for Amazon to take my credit card information and send it securely to whatever server or whatever they do on the back end and process it and then process what I want in my order and get it to me in the way that I can have it in one or two days or whatever it takes, right? There are certain mechanics that have to be in place to make e-commerce possible. So the distinction I'm going to argue between commerce and e-commerce is one, the location, and two, the mechanics of how it happens. And the same thing can be applied to e-history. E-history is simultaneously about the location where the historical transaction happens in a digital environment, but also about the mechanics behind the scenes that make e-history possible. And we're going to get into those mechanics in a little bit, because the book actually spends a considerable amount of time talking about the various mechanics behind the scenes that make e-history visible in your feeds. But that two-pronged distinction leads into my definition of e-history, which is on the very first page of the book, and it says the following. By the way, e-history is kind of like deer. It can be singular or plural. Um, e-history are discrete media products that package an element or elements of the past for consumption on the social web and which try to leverage the social web in order to gain visibility. Examples of e-history include history YouTube videos, Twitter threads, Instagram posts, podcasts, and Wikipedia pages. OK, so let's unpack this definition real quick. The past is a very big place. You can't tell all of it all at once. You have to package it in some way to fit into this little tiny space, whether it's on your screen or in a 280 character tweet. So all e-history, I argue, is taking some element or elements of the past and packaging it into some sort of media product for consumption on the web. That is a common factor to all e-history, regardless of what platform it's on. That's the first part of the definition. The second part of the definition, though, rests on an assumption that I have. And that assumption is this. There is absolutely no reason to put something on the web unless you want people to see it. If you didn't want people to see it, you wouldn't put it online. Now, you may not, the, who you want to see it and how many people you want to see it, that may vary. Maybe you want 10 people to see it. Maybe you want 10 million people to see it. But in essence, all e-history that is put online is striving to achieve visibility. And the way that it has to achieve visibility is by leveraging the mechanics of the social web. In other words, it has to take advantage of how the social web works and the assumptions inside of social media in order to show up on your phone. And I argue that all e-history is trying to do that. All e-history is trying to become visible. It just becomes visible in different ways. And we're going to talk about those ways. But that is the commonality between all these different platforms and all those billions and billions and billions of pieces of e-history out there. This is why I feel comfortable having a common definition for that entire universe of content. So I mentioned I was going to come back to this video earlier. This is a very successful piece of e-history. Right? It fits the definition. Number one, it packages an element of the past into a media product for consumption online. In this case, it is packaging elements of the US Civil War into a video that can be viewed on YouTube. And 
It's leveraging the mechanics of YouTube and the way social media works in order to achieve visibility. And as I mentioned earlier, it did a very good job of that because it achieved 30 to 40 million views online, right? So this is a particularly successful uh, piece of e-history. And then the question becomes, why? Why did this video become so successful, so visible, I should say, right? You could put a video up online about the Civil War right now. It might only get 10 views or 15 views. Why did this one get 30 to 40 million? Well, part of it was the timing. This video came out in the summer of 2015. Anyone remember what happened in the summer of 2015? What seismic event? There was a massacre at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. And that massacre prompted a debate about the Confederate flag and its place in American history and American culture. It is not a coincidence that this video came out only eight weeks after that event. And it's also not a coincidence that the Confederate flag is featured very prominently in the center of this video. So this video is leveraging the social media debates and online debates about the Confederate flag. It is, quote unquote, newsworthy, an example of what I talk in the book about as the newsworthy past, when history becomes part of the news cycle, becomes something that everybody is talking about as part of the news cycle. So this piece of e-history leverages the newsworthiness of the past in order to tap into a very public debate online and achieve mass visibility. But there's another piece about this video that I haven't told you. Because this video only racked up a couple of million views on YouTube. So where did it get the tens of millions of other views? Anybody have a guess? Facebook. And it turns out that this video was actually made not by an educational institution, but by a company called PragerU. Has anyone ever heard of PragerU? So PragerU is a conservative political action committee based out of Los Angeles, run by a man named Dennis Prager. And they are one of the largest political spenders on Facebook, in the top 10, actually. So this also leveraged the commercial aspects of the social web, right? to achieve mass visibility on a platform. Bought its way to the top, one might say. So this is an example of why we need to ask questions and understand who is creating this content, what the agendas are behind it, and how it is achieving visibility on different platforms. Because it turns out that the e-history that we see in our feeds oftentimes has a much deeper story behind it that we need to interrogate in order to fully understand it as a piece of content. And that is one of the reasons why I wrote this book. This book is not just about social media. This book is about media literacy and historical literacy, giving people tools to ask questions about the content that they see in their feeds every day and why they're seeing it and what agendas are behind it and what mechanics of the social web it's leveraging in order to make sure that it gets in front of your eyes on your phones. Because it's not an accident when something shows up in your newsfeed. There's a lot of mechanics behind the scenes making that possible. So all this is e-history with various agendas and various people, the characters behind them. This is all e-history. It turns out that e-history is everywhere. And amid this huge universe of content, as I mentioned, 58 billion on TikTok, 50 million on Instagram, it turns out that e-history is a very large category of content on the social web. There are millions and millions of videos and blogs and memes and podcasts and all other things competing for our attention, advancing political and commercial agendas, and actively reshaping what we know about the past. And what's really interesting about it, and I talk about these examples in the book, is that some of these amass millions of views, and some of them are barely seen. Some of them are actually made by professional historians. This is not a distinction between professional history and non-professional history. There are plenty of professional historians who make e-history content. Much of it does not become visible, which we'll talk about why in a minute. So some of it is actually made and informed by scholarship, but others is made by journalists, history enthusiasts, white supremacists, Russian disinformation agents, it can often be very difficult to determine which e-history is created by whom. But the sum effect has been 
this expansive e-history universe, which is as large or as any large, uh, large as any category on the web, playing an enormous role in shaping the histories we encounter. OK, so this is the last thing I want to talk about before we get into the Q&A and the discussion part of this talk. I've told you a little bit about e-history. I've told you a little bit about the background about writing the book. I've told you a little bit about the agendas and stuff behind the various pieces of e-history that we see. But as I was researching and writing this book, I kept coming back to this question. Why does e-history exist at all? Like, what really explains this phenomenon? What's really going on here? And in the tech world, which unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I've become very well versed in, um, we often talk about solving a problem, right? You want to start a new product, launch a new startup. Your investors, your VCs, whatever, they'll come to you. They'll say, OK, well, what problem are you solving, right? So Airbnb, for example, where I'm staying tonight, that solved the problem of people not wanting to pay a lot of money to stay in hotels. They'd rather spend less money and stay in people's homes and guest bedrooms and stuff. OK, so that's what problem that solved. What problem is e-history solving? So, the more I began to ask myself that question, the more interesting this question got, and the, the more uh, this picture started to emerge for me. I want to argue to you tonight, and I argue this in the book, that e-history solves a problem. Namely, it solves the problem of how do you transpose the study of history into the web and social media. And this problem exists, I'm going to argue to you, because at heart, the values that underpin the professional discipline of history are actually starkly at odds with the values that underpin the social web. OK? So what do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to argue that professional history is an expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit that is time-consuming and rests on its intrinsic value. The social web, on the other hand, is a user-centric, data-driven commercial enterprise that is instantly gratifying and privileges extrinsic value. It is that clash that creates the conditions for e-history to emerge. So let me unpack this, because there's a lot, a lot of words here, OK? Let's go one at a time. First, professional history. Professional history, I'm going to argue, is expert-centric. It puts experts at the center of communicative power, right? When you go into a history classroom, the professor teaches and the students learn. When you go into a museum, the museum curators write the wall text and put the exhibits together, and you as the visitor learn from the curator. When you go to the National Park Service, the expert gives you the tour, and you learn from the tour. Now, there's a lot of gray area here. There's a lot of discourse that happens. It's a dialectical relationship. I get all that. But at its heart, history as a field, as a profession, it values expertise. You get a PhD in history when you're deemed to have sufficient expertise in a subject. It is an expert-centric discipline. The social web, on the other hand, was purposefully designed not to be expert-centric. It was designed to be user-centric. It privileges user interactions, regardless of whether those users are experts or not. And in fact, some platforms were actually created with the sole purpose of sticking it to experts. If you look at the foundation of Wikipedia, the founders of Wikipedia actually purposefully said that they wanted to take power away from experts. They wanted Wikipedia to be the opposite of graduate school, right? So social media at its heart, I will argue, has actually an antipathy towards expertise embedded within it, and it is actually user-centric. So expert-centric versus user-centric. That's one clash. Next. History is an always evolving intellectual pursuit. If you talk to historians, professional historians about what they do, they will say to you that our understanding of the past is constantly evolving. We're constantly finding new sources. We're constantly making new arguments. What we know about the past is always changing and ever in flux. And it's this intellectual exercise to think through it. Well, I hate to break it to you if this is news to you, but the social web is not an intellectual exercise or an intellectual pursuit. It is a data-driven commercial enterprise. Google and Facebook and other platforms are primarily advertising businesses. They take somewhere between 95 and 98% of their revenue comes from advertising. It is a commercially driven, data-driven enterprise, not an always evolving intellectual pursuit. That's clash number two. Number three, history is time-consuming. 
It took me five and a half years to write this book. It takes seven years to get a PhD. It takes several years to put together a museum exhibit. It takes forever to get through an archive and sort everything and write finding aids. History takes a long time. There is a lot of friction built into the discipline, right? That is embedded into the discipline. The web promises the opposite. The web promises you instant answers to whatever questions you have. It is designed to be instantly gratifying, to get you from point A to point B as quickly as possible with as little friction as possible. You have a question about history, you can get an answer right away. You want to know something about the past, you can get an answer right away. Instantly gratifying versus time consuming. That is prob clash number three. And finally, if you talk to people who are professional historians or care about history, they will tell you that history has intrinsic value. In other words, it's important to know about history because history is important, right? History is just kind of a good thing for society to know about, regardless of anybody actually reading the books or going and attending the lectures, right? History is just something that you're supposed to know because it's intrinsically valuable to know something about it. Well, again, I hate to break it to you if this is news to you, but on the web, nothing has intrinsic value. Nothing. Everything on the web is based on extrinsic measures of valuation. What do I mean by that? Clicks, views, shares, likes. The more views and shares and likes and clicks something has, the more valuable it becomes. The more visibility you have online, the more that can grant you authority, the more that can grant you influence, the more that can grant you power. There is nothing on the web that has any intrinsic value. It's just not how the web was set up. Intrinsic value clashing with extrinsic value. So if we put this all together, and you'll have to excuse my really amateur chart here, <laughs> what you have is you have an expert-centric, always evolving intellectual pursuit that is time consuming and intrinsically valuable that you are trying to wedge into an ecosystem and into an architecture that is user-centric, data-driven, instantly gratifying, and extrinsically valuable. It is literally like putting a square peg into a round hole. And e-history is the bridge that makes that possible, right? But this, I think, is why doing good history communication online is actually so hard. Because the web, the social web, was actually designed with the exact opposite values of the professional discipline of history. You're literally trying to put a square peg into a round hole when you do e-history online. And for a lot of professional historians and even some journalists, it's very difficult. And I think this is actually the reason. I stumbled on the reason why we needed history communication when I was trying to write a book about history communication. Um, so I think I have more I could say about this, but I want to kind of skip to the end. I'll just really briefly kind of tell you what these slides are about. The book is organized by different mechanisms by which e-history becomes visible. So I mentioned earlier that that YouTube video we looked at leveraged something I called the newsworthy past. Um, and so I have all kinds of different examples of different ways that e-history online can become visible. It can be crowdsourced, it can rely on nostalgia, it can tap into virality, it can leverage the news cycle, it can even leverage AI. I'm not going to go into this here, but if this interests you, I encourage you to read the book because there's examples and case studies which make this a lot, a lot more concrete. But I want to go back to this slide because I talked at the beginning about how the goal of all history, of all e-history online is to become visible. So there's all these different mechanisms that e-history uses to try to become visible. But what I realized uh, at the end of writing this book was actually the e-history that aligned with the values of the social web was actually the e-history that was most likely to get seen. So in other words, the more that a piece of e-history content online adheres to the values and the architecture that the web has embedded within it, the more likely it is to show up on your feed. And the less like that content it is, the less likely it is to show up in your feed. The most visible and influential e-history online tends to mirror the values of the web itself. And to put this into graph form so it makes some sense, Right? The expert-centric, always evolving, time-consuming, intrinsically valuable content online tends to not get seen. And the content that is user-centric, data-driven, instantly gratifying, extrinsically valuable is the content that does tend to get seen. 
So the more that a piece of e-history content aligns with these values as opposed to these values, the more likely you are to see it. The more likely it is to show up in your newsfeed. So what that means, at least in my estimation, is that the more e-history becomes like this, the more influence it has, the more visibility it gets, the more power it has, and the more it becomes considered valuable for how it can be put into service for various different agendas. And the more that e-history is like this, the more it is considered not to be publicly valued information, it is underfunded and undersupported. And we're seeing this actually play out not just online but offline as well, right? Because the expert-centric, always evolving intellectual work that is time-consuming and intrinsically valuable is the work that is increasingly the most difficult to fund. It's the work that is the most increasingly difficult to get grants for, to get fellowships for, and to get support for. So the values of the social web are not just affecting how we view history content on the web, it's actually affecting how we think about the humanities and history content beyond the web as well. And so as we think about this moment where history courses are under-enrolled, where history faculty are being cut, where the history profession itself is experiencing a crisis, both in terms of relevancy and in terms of funding, when I walked away from this book, I got to thinking that actually the social web has played a huge role in this. That's why the book is called History Disrupted, right? Because these values are becoming the ones that we espouse and that we support and that we fund. And these are the ones that we increasingly are not paying enough attention to and are not funding. Also, just very plainly, right, with billions and billions of pieces of e-history available for free online, when I talked to people and interviewed people for this book, people would tell me, why should I take a history class if I can just watch all these YouTube videos on the web, right? Why should I pay a historian to come talk to me when I can just go look things up on Wikipedia, right? So it's not only that these values are becoming the values by which we judge history content, it's also that there's just so much history content online now that people are sort of making the argument about why do I need to pay for it? Why do I need to pay for it in a college setting? Why do I need to pay for it in a professional setting? So I think all of this is, liber is contributing to the disruption of history, the history profession, understandings of history, that the book is alluding to with the title History Disrupted. And finally, the question that I asked is, you know, does this mean that we know history any better? With billions and billions of pieces of history content online, you would hope that at least we understand the past a little bit better. But I could actually not find any evidence that that was the case. I did a lot of interviews. I did a lot of research and reading. Nothing I found convinced me that all this content online is actually leading to a better understanding of the past. A lot of people told me it actually causes them confusion and overwhelmment because there's so much content online. and You don't know who is creating it. You don't know the agendas behind it that it puts a lot of onus and burden on the user to figure it out for him or herself. And a lot of people told me that they just eventually tune out. In fact, people would tell me that they scroll through their phones, they look at all this history content, and then they look up and they have no idea what they saw. They don't remember anything that they saw, and they don't really have any interest in digging any deeper. So one of the myths that we've told ourselves as historians is that if we just put stuff up online, people will click on it and they'll be inspired to learn more and they'll dive deeper and they'll buy our books and they'll go to the archive. Well, I haven't found any evidence that that's really happening. I mean, it's happening anecdotally. You can always find someone who listened to a podcast and said, oh yeah, I went and bought the book about it. But is it happening en masse? I don't see any evidence that that's the case. Otherwise, there'd be more books being sold and more people in history classes. What I do think, though, is happening is it's not that we have a, a more sophisticated understanding of the past, but rather we are embedding deeper the values of the social web into our lives. So the more we use social media, the more its values become our values. The more we use social media to communicate the past, the more we think about the past as being user-centric, data-driven, instantly gratifying, and extrinsically valuable, and not expert-centric, always evolving, time-consuming, and intrinsically valuable. That is why I have argued that e-history is actually changing the very definition of history right before our eyes. So 
Where do we go from here? What do we do about it? Well, that's the History Communication Institute, which Troy mentioned in the intro. I'll talk more about that during the Q&A if people are interested. But this is our group that is getting together to think about how we do ethical e-history in the social media environment and how we communicate history with this reality now in front of us. And it's also about building partnerships and alliances with different stakeholders. I'm glad there's some tech and computer science people here because part of what the History Communication Institute is doing is building bridges with tech companies and asking them, hey, listen, you know, how can we work together to create an information environment online that actually promotes good and accurate history, that actually upholds the values of the history profession? And to my delight, tech platforms have actually been interested in this question. I've actually just had a meeting with Microsoft about it a couple months ago. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this. I think it just took a book and some kind of uh, messenger or messengers to go out there and talk about it and bring it to people's attention. Um, I also have a Substack newsletter. Uh, at one point, this book was 80,000 words. I cut it down to 50,000 in the finished version. So that extra 30,000 words is oftentimes showing up as newsletter articles in my newsletter, uh, where I talk about a variety of different sub things related to this, talk about disinformation campaigns that leverage e-history, talk about um, different types of e-history that go viral online and why. So if you're interested, I encourage you to sign up and keep in touch. I'd love to hear from you. I'm very easy to find online if you Google me or look for me on social media. And if you are interested in this project or want to support the book, obviously you can read it, but you can also uh, leave a review. You can hit me up for an interview or if you want to do something to collaborate, I'd be happy to talk about that. And with that, I want to thank you and I welcome your questions. Uh, so quickly, um, I wanted to bring uh, Casey Lucini Butcher up here because uh, we have a public historian on campus, so why not have that person lead us in a brief Q&A. There is also a reception and book signing afterwards, so if you want to ask Jason a question, buy a book. <laughs> All right, Casey Lucini, Lucini Butcher is an award-winning public historian whose work is dedicated to building empathy and advancing social justice. Uh, she is currently the director of the UW-Madison History Project, and in case you haven't heard, starting in July, the project will be the Rebecca M. Blank Center for Campus History. Uh, side note, Casey is the best hire this campus has made in my 15 plus years here. Uh, Casey. I swear Troy sets out to embarrass me at these things. Um, Thank you so much, Jason, for being here. I was really excited. Whenever I get asked to do a Q&A, I say yes, because it's always somebody I really admire, and that means I get to sneak in my question. Um, so it's always selfish. So I'm going to kick the Q&A off with a personal question that I have, and then I'll be walking around um, and handing you a microphone to ask your questions. So as I was reading the book, um, you there is an ongoing history debate in the field so i'm going to ask the nerdy question i was asking troy should i ask the public question or the nerdy question i'm going to go with the nerdy question the history field is kind of having is in crisis as you mentioned and there is an internal debate in the field about whether presentism and when people in the history field say presentism there's a scary ghost sound afterward Ooh. Um, and it's this question of you know do we study history for history's sake because we believe that history has intrinsic value and so we study it because it has that intrinsic value or should we do better about recognizing its intrinsic value while also recognizing its extrinsic value that history affects politics and policy that it affects current social justice movements that we should be better about communicating that extrinsic value maybe to the public while also adhering to its intrinsic value. And so I'm curious as we're kind of looking at the debate that's going on in the field and then you have this book that is showing the perils of the kind of extrinsic value. How do you think about presentism or these debates about the field and intrinsic value versus an extrinsic value, not only as they're happening on social media, but also in relation to like the capital H history field, public history, and the web, where all these things kind of seem to be coalescing and, and mixing? Yeah, just really briefly, um, I think that it's a big field and there's lots of room for all different types of people in the profession who want to do different things. So if you want to be out there, uh, in Washington, in think tanks, and uh, doing work that connects to the headlines of the day, why not? And if you want to uh, be a professor working on uh, Byzantine art and uh, its effects on 9th and 10th century Greece, and uh, just want to stay in that little lane and do your research, I feel like there should be room for that too. Um, I kind of see it as a little bit of like a false debate. Um, and I'm not really sure 
uh, why it has to be that way. The challenge is we just have to make sure that there's funding for all types of work that people want to do. And my worry is that the uh, work that cannot demonstrate any sort of extrinsic value on social media or on the social web uh, just may not get the funding, in which case uh, it won't be there for people to benefit from or to do. And just as a quick anecdote about this, so when the war in Ukraine broke out, uh, universities were scrambling to find Ukrainian historians or historians who had expertise on Ukraine within their departments to comment on the news cycle and get them into the news uh, so that they could get headlines about their university or whatever. And there was this great anecdote that came out where uh, you know the university public relations department and the president's office called down to the history department and said, hey, well, who are the Ukraine experts? Where are the Ukraine experts? And the department chair said, oh, you got rid of them years ago, right? You didn't fund them, right? Because you didn't think they had any value. You were so obsessed with what was making headlines at that time that you didn't invest in having different disciplines represented. And so then when you needed somebody, they weren't there, right? So uh, I worry about that more than I worry about these other debates. OK, I'm going to walk around. Who has a question? My boots are really loud, so you'll always know where I am in this room. I saw your hand first, so I'm coming back. And if you're willing to introduce yourself, just so I know your background and you know, what you're, where you're coming from, on this question, that'd be great. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Vaughn. Um, I'm retired now, but uh, I started teaching here in the early 1980s, and I did a book then called The Vital Pass. I was trained in history, but I taught in a journalism program, and the pro problem then was, of course, history was in decline. And it seems to me the, the media environment at that point was primarily television. This was before the digital revolution. And um, I did a, the book I did was a vital pass where I tried to pull together a number of historians and others who defended history. What seems to me has happened now with the digital revolution, with computers, uh, artificial intelligence, and so forth, that this is almost exponentially a greater challenge than it was in the early 80s to explain the value of history because it's so easy to create false histories, false narratives. Uh, and to make them look realistic. And so I, I enjoy your talk. I think what you've done here is really quite, uh, quite important. And I'd like to see us you know, step back and um, look at, a, at the broader picture of this, because I think this, is a, this, 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 this issue is something that has uh, been throughout my entire career here uh, at UW. And I think it goes back even further than that. You could go back seems like World War I uh, seems to have been the really big dividing line. Yeah, but so I mentioned that there were 30,000 words that I took out of the book. So originally, I had a first chapter in the book that went into more of this history, which talked about earlier uh, communications revolutions, earlier technologies, also looked more at the history of history itself, right? But it was just kind of dragging on. It just became a book that I felt like maybe not everybody's going to want to read. It may be a little bit more too, like, for academics. And I really wanted this to be read by journalists and by policymakers and have it be short and readable. So I decided to take all that stuff out, start with an anecdote, and really just stick to understanding this phenomenon of the social web, which is what I've done. But I, there's certainly a case to be made that there are elements of this to date further back to when I start the book. And there certainly, I think, would be a really great book, if someone wants to write it, to look at some of those other disruptive technologies and do a comparative study, right? I think that'd be fascinating, and I'd love to read that book. That just wasn't my project in my book. Uh, and I didn't feel like I, could, I had enough expertise to write that well. And it's interesting you brought up television, because one of the things I uh, talk about in this book is I talk about the decline of journalism and kind of make a parallel with history. And you know, there's this rhetoric out there that the digital was the death of journalism. But if you actually look at the history of journalism, newspaper circulation really started declining with the advent of television. That was the disruptive technology. And journalists actually invested a lot of money in training their journalists to be more like entertainers and more like television presenters in the 70s and 80s in order to combat the effects of television, which again, I think, kind of makes the case for history communication, right? Like, why aren't historians doing this? Why aren't we doing more investment in this? And now, we have done some things. The AHA has done some things. But I think we could do 
um, a lot more. We're running short on time, so let's talk more. Okay. Let's talk more afterwards. I want to make sure other voices get included, um, and we have a lot more people with their hands up. But thank you for your comment. <clears throat> Hi, Jason. Nice to see you. So I'm the uh, history in, uh, senior in history, and uh, also I'm the uh, research assistant of the Center of East Asian Studies. Cool. So we are doing a, actually the public history project about the Chinese student history in medicine. And I have two questions. First of all, your concept of the e-history, let me remind me uh, another historian, Carl Baker, you know, also a badger here in medicine, who have a speech in 1931 called uh, "Everybody is His Own Historian." He mentioned about you know the divisions of the historian and the realities at that times because he remind uh, the people that in the late eight, uh, 19th centuries, most of the historians are not were not professional; they work as the peoples. I'm going to stop you yeah, right there. Yeah. E-history has nothing to do with the distinction between professionals and non-professionals, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because there are professional historians who yeah. make e-history. Yeah. E-history is this definition. It's about a media product created for the social web that is trying to achieve visibility. So I'm well aware of the past histories yeah. and the past complaints yeah. by past historians yeah, no about how the public is its own historian. It's a long, well tradition in our field. But also, he had another point that we need to face the utilized of the history. So he said everybody had the right to remember the history they think they are useful. You know, what do you think about this kind of concept would relate with, you know, the your concept mentioned about to, the, making the history useful online? Because, uh, you know, like the, this is my first question. And my second question is about, because I found that among the young people, you know, there are a lot of people interested in the history because they play video games. And the, those video games histories, you know, like the, you know, the Assassins and the Heart of Iron, this kind of things, the people playing the, uh, the, the historical countries in the video games. So what kind of place do you think you, you put the video game history in your whole series of the e-history? You know, and how they shaped the, the, the you know, people's view on history? Thank you so much. I'm so glad you asked that question because that gives me a chance to plug my Substack. I have a whole article about this on my Substack. So I would encourage you to sign up for my Substack. I'm on the, I'm on the presidential councils of the National World War II Museum. How many World War II video games are there? Hundreds, right? How many World War I video games are there? Hundreds. Okay. So I, I talk to a lot of people about history of video games. I have two concerns about video games. One, when you talk to video game designers, they will tell you that the accuracy of the history is not a concern to them, right? So it is a dramatization of history. So it needs to be understood as such. Now, you can get people who come into your classroom who know everything there is to know about a particular weapon from World War II, but they can't tell you a thing about the Nazis, okay? So that doesn't seem to me to be like a good substitute for deep historical knowledge. Although it can be, as you say, a gateway into it. But the question then becomes, are people actually taking that gateway to learn more? And I haven't seen a lot of evidence that that's actually happening. Now, it may be happening. I just haven't seen the evidence. But I encourage you to read this article on my uh, website to learn more about what I think about that. To your other point, I think it's important to understand what this project is. This project is as much about media literacy as it is about history. right? So the question is not about usefulness per se. It's about understanding why certain pieces of history content online become visible in your feed and having the tools and the skills to ask critical questions about that. And you'd be surprised, outside of a university setting, how few people actually know how to do that. So this book has been very valuable to, for example, social studies teachers in high school classrooms who have students coming in asking questions or spouting conspiracy theories that they're finding about history on TikTok. And this book gives them tools to assess and analyze that information and ask critical questions about it. So I think on some level, you and I are talking about slightly different things, even though they're clearly connected because they're all about this question about history and the public. But that's what this book is really about. And I think if you understand the agendas and the creators, behind this e-history content better, and you understand the mechanics of the social web that are being used to make this content visible in your feed, you become a better information consumer. 
And as Troy said, that is my purpose, to make a more media literate and historically literate citizenry. And if this book makes a contribution, then I will have done my part. You have to turn the green button on. Uh, thank you, Jason. So the reception, Libby, which way is there? Sorry, we've run out of time. Libby, which way is the reception? Right here, there's, there's books for sale. Books for sale. Sign them, and there's food. food. Eat, and I will answer more of your questions. Yes. <laughs> I'm around. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Jason and Casey.